Yeah, but being trapped on the top of a tree dressed as Jessica Rabbit, right, is terrifying. I was eight years old. Uh, hey, uh, welcome to uh, this episode of Ask a Brit. This is uh, episode number 15, or should I say volume number 15, because I'm pretentious and deep. Um, and uh, of course, as ever, this is the format in which I ask you fine people to ask me, a Brit, a question, and to use the hashtag Ask a Brit in order for me to find that question and include it in next week's episode. Uh, but we're going to dive right into the questions, most of which, all of which, in fact, came in the last week. That's kind of how this works. I'm not in a car this week. I'm back in Chicago, so that's certainly an improvement on the weeks that have gone before. What's my cat doing? He's trying to get probably in the closet. Um, last week he was getting out of it. And uh, we're going to start off, uh, first question comes from Katie Lake, and Katie asks, how hard was it for you to get used to driving on what for you is the wrong side of the road uh, when you moved here to America? Well, firstly, I never actually drove in the UK and I, I haven't learned to drive here, so I'm the worst person to ask that question to. But speaking to fellow Brits that have moved here, um, I think they, they find it difficult at first, obviously. You've got oncoming traffic if you're on the wrong side of the... Kind of like in planes, trains and automobiles. That's, that's how I imagine it would be for a lot of people. Oncoming trucks and you turn into the devil, right? But after the first few goes of it, you overcome those issues, I think, is what I'm told. And everything's fine. So, not as scary as it sounds, but it's certainly a talking point. And the next question comes from Alexandra S. This is, this is not going to be divisive at all. Uh, do you think Americans are as stupid as what many people around the world seem to think? No, I don't, on the whole, because it's, it's such a generalised um, you know, viewpoint, I think, to have. Um, obviously, we've all seen those videos of people sticking a microphone to people on the street and saying, you know, what's the capital of Saudi Arabia, you know, or whatnot, um, and, and all of that. And that, okay, we, we do uncover um, people whose world knowledge might be sort of less than that of your local library. Um, but uh, those people exist in my country too, and they exist in, I would say, every country. So levels of stupidity, I couldn't tell you if they're higher here. What I will tell you is they're more... They're louder and they're more noticeable, I think. They do make their way into social media and into um, just media in general. Um, and you get a lot of crazy, crazy things that happen here. But again, I work with somebody who didn't know who Hitler was. So that's in the UK. So that's, you know, crazy as it were. Lisa Meath asks, who is your favorite British author and American author and genre of books? British, it's got to be, as you pointed out, uh, between George Orwell um, or Douglas Adams, because of my favourite, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In terms of American authors, I am rather partial to Mark Twain, but that goes back to my youth when I read Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and all of that. And don't touch the tripod, kitten. And he nearly knocked it over. And, um, but, but contemporary, or, or I suppose not contemporary any, anymore, in fact he never has been in my lifetime, um, Get Away Kitten, my goodness, is uh, J.D. Salinger, um, Catcher in the Rye, um, read that really controversial book a few years ago and loved it. I read it in a day, I think, and it's rare for me to do that because I'm usually so crazily busy, right, I'm not really cat and favorite genre of books i think uh possibly surreal books as in sort of surreal worlds so the world of douglas adams or the world of douglas adams um but also a favorite old friend 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 writer of mine is robert rankin you should check him out one of my favorites uh, there is nostradamus ate my hamster is a book um as well as the cornelius murphy trilogy check that out um but yeah just sort of surreal stuff is fun for me, as well as Pink Elephant in bras. That's, where did that go come from? Susie Q, uh, have you seen the movie Dunkirk? Yes, I have. It was fabulous. Saw it in the cinema a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, Susie says, I saw it yesterday and loved it, but subtitles would have been nice. So as I could not understand the British actors, uh, who are speaking, and my husband is hard of hearing, even with his hearing aids. Um, I, I can understand that, especially with the ones that had the masks over their faces. It was hard to lip-read them. Um, I, I think with that film, though, I didn't feel like I needed to understand every single word. And, you know, I'm a Brit, but sometimes even sort of British um, accents, specific accents from around Britain, uh, do sound like a foreign language, especially Geordie. But I don't know that there are any Geordies 
in this film. Um, but I think, though, just the harshness of war in general um, is a language of its own that I think I, I, I understood rather well. Um, but yes, I, I quite understand. Um, uh, maybe I should use subtitles. Now, now I'm convinced that I might also be part of this problem, uh, but we'll look into that. Uh, JWB52Z, um, I don't hear cheerio much from UK citizens, but I do hear cheery bye for some reason. Oh, and for some reason, that makes me cringe. Are there words that do that to you? Uh, whew, I don't know about words. There are some uh, phrases from, from the modern uh, vernacular of both Americans and British people that somewhat make me cringe. I don't know, I, for some reason, when people go, really? 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 That pisses me off, but uh, I don't know. Other than that, I uh, can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, fidget spinners. No, it's just a fad, isn't it? It's not necessarily notable for the word itself. Um, okay, next question. I've been meaning to answer this for the last... 10 weeks, three weeks, more like three, uh, from Anna Addison, um, who asks, or says, a little bird told me that British men are incurable flirts. But Anna says, but you cannot get one to have an intelligent conversation about the lively subject of sex without causing major embarrassment. I know there is a culture difference, but come on, flirting is flirting, right? Absolutely. And uh, I'm not embarrassed at all. Um, hence why I've not answered your question for three weeks, but it's just, we are. I think, I think Brits, we are, well, I don't know, because here's the thing, we like to, uh, you know, talk in innuendo, I mean, I do it all the time on this show, um, and at the same time, yeah, when you sit down to have a serious, intelligent discussion on the topic, um, men specifically will find a way to talk about willies uh, in a humorous way to lighten the mood. Um, so I, I don't know, I, that might not even be a British thing, honestly, I, I, I suspect... American men are somewhat the same, but I, I think attitudes to sex vary on either side of the pond. Um, I'm not sure who's, who has the healthiest attitude, honestly. They're, they're both sort of questionable in many ways. Um, but uh, I say this from the comfort of my bed. I'm not doing anything. I mean, I am fully clothed. Don't. But uh, yeah, that, uh, it is an interesting topic of discussion and you know one that I think would uh, lend itself to a good video. This is one thing I will say, um, and again, it, it sort of lends itself to the lack of seriousness on the subject. Um, I did do a list of uh, British sort of sex words, um, you know, that mean all sorts of different aspects of it. And uh, I, I just ran out of like page room after a while because there were so many. I mean, you can't run out of page room. It's the internet. It's more or less infinite in size, length. I don't know how you measure the internet, uh, frankly, but um, you could surpass it with British sex words. Rob Norris, um, I was listening to Penny Lane by the Beatles again, and I've always wondered what fish and finger pies were. Um, are both fish and fingers in them, or is it fish as in fish shops and finger pies as in finger food? Um, Hmm. Well, see, fish and finger pies has a, a, has a rude connotation in many ways, uh, sort of sticking with what we were talking about just a moment ago. Um, so I'll leave that to you to, to look up. But um, it can also be a, a type of food, I suppose. Um, and in fact, you know, I, I, I suspect, or I think, it could be a pie with fish fingers in it. Oh, fish fingers, if you're not aware, are what the Americans, more or less anyway, what the Americans call fish sticks. Um, there are some subtle differences, which I'm sure, you know, people will go crazy about in the comments. But um, back in the day before I was a vegetarian, I've never mentioned, by the way, that I, I'm a vegetarian. We don't get to talk about that very, I am very serious about it. So don't, don't mock me. I'm joking, I'm joking. But fish fingers, yes, uh, before I was a vegetarian, one of my favourite foods ever, and them in a pie, sticking fingers, fish fingers in a pie, it, it does sound dirty, I'm not going to lie, it does. Um, but it would be tremendous. Scootaloo asks, have you ever been to or on the London Eye before? If so, what did you think of the view slash experience? I have been on the London Eye a couple of times actually and I have uh, an insane and rather irrational fear of heights um, and this was of course very evident to the people that 
were on the eye with me, uh, namely my wife and my new in-laws. Well, they weren't my in-laws yet, they would become my in-laws, but I was meeting them more or less for the first time and this was their early impression of me uh, vomiting all over a child. Um, that's something I do regardless of the fear of heights, mind you. But, um, but on this particular occasion, yeah, I was dizzy as a dizzy truck, if that's even a thing. And I, I, I remember just, you know, looking down at the, the, the Houses of Parliament and the River Thames and um, thinking it was just some sort of uh, lucid, surreal painting by Salvador Dali because everything was dripping. Um, that was my sweat, actually, just in front of my eyes. And uh, I wept. And uh, John McConnell asks, uh, speaking of American musical artists, can you think about any American performers or groups that are very popular in the UK, uh, but unheard of in the US? Uh, there was a guy called Elvis back in the 50s and 60s that was huge in Britain and was not heard of uh, here in the US. Um, and uh, he, he racked up a few records over there. Other than that, I don't know of anybody. Um, really, I'm I'm not up to date on modern music, uh, so I couldn't tell you. I I would say, oh, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, it has happened the other way round. I know that there was the band Bush, and the lead singer Gavin Rossdale, I think his name was, uh, married to Gwen Stefani at one point. Am I right on my? Who knows? We'll look it up later. Who sure was you know he was certainly known in the UK, but he had more success, I think. In the US, and and there have been examples of of that the other way around, but I'd have to look up the uh, American version because uh, obviously I was lying about Elvis Presley, um, who I believe was big in Hawaii. And then uh, Trojan Mice Broadcast, that's got to be name of the week, or at least longest name of the week, asks, um, are there uh, lots of Brits back home that would find America as an exotic land of fascinating geography and, uh, and uh, biodiversity, culture, history that spans thousands of years? Absolutely. Um, well, specifically on the first part of that question, I think that that's one of the things, as I pointed out many a time, really speaks to me is the landscape of the place. I mean, I live in the city right now, which has a landscape all of its own, man-made for the most part. Um, but yes, I mean, obviously I'm trying to get to all 50 states, I'm speaking now just about myself, which is something I excel at, of course. Um, but I would, I would myself love to see all of that. And I think that you know, it's well known among most Brits that America is quite a diverse land in terms of its geography and geographical makeup. Um, so yes, I would say that. I do think though that we have this viewpoint of America that it's all uh, palm trees and swimming pools, um, or at least I did until I moved to the Midwest and then uh, I, I froze my nuts off. Sorry for that lewdness. I'm apologising for... Sorry Anna, you, you probably are disgusted at me right now for even apologising on that. Um, as for the history side of things, we're, we're completely aware how, how it does go back thousands of years, of course, because of uh, Native American culture and all of that, but I think that uh, we more propagate, as perhaps America itself does, um, the sort of the Western history, um, as it were. Um, and, uh, and so that is something that makes it into our films and, and whatnot more readily speaking. Um, but I'm probably generalizing in some sense. So the next question comes from an even longer name. Uh, this is Christina. How can I make my name longer Montoya? That's her actual birth name. And Christina asks, why do English slash bridge say cheers other than toasting? And what does it mean? When did it start? I don't know when it started. It sounds like a sort of turn of the 20th century type thing, but I could be completely wrong about that. Haven't looked it up before the video, I should have done. Um, but it really does just mean kind of, you know, cheers, toast, there you go. Um, you know, it means merriment, have, have a merry day, have a good Christmas, you know, enjoy your cousin's wedding. You know, who enjoys their cousin's wedding? Not me. Um, but you say cheers anyway, out of politeness, you know, you'll do well with this chap that you found and brought into your life and eventually will divorce, you know, but cheers anyway. It's, that's, that's the good life. And that's why we're cheering to that. Uh, Flying Brian um, asks, well, he asked two questions, in fact. Um, what makes an apartment an apartment? What makes a flat a flat? I have read that there is a distinguishment to be made here, um, though I'm not entirely certain what it is. To me, a flat 
is the same thing as an, an apartment, only you know there's a cultural divide over the vocabulary that is used. Um, so I don't know, I couldn't speak to it in that sense. Though here in America, there is a type of building that is referred to as a flat that is somewhat different from both of them. Um, it's uh, nuanced in, in many ways, but I would have to look up the, the nuances of those. Um, and then you also go on to ask about the differences between the idea of uh, in America, a college being called a college, but it being called a university in the UK, and those more or less do mean the exact same thing. However, I'd like to point out that we have colleges in the UK, and in fact I attended one between the ages of 16 and 18, or at least that's what it should have been, but I did it for a whole four years, uh, for a reason that uh, only I can explain, and even I can't explain it, so... Uh, we'll skip on from that, um, but the fact is, before I went to university, I attended college in what was kind of like the last two years of uh, what you would consider high school, um, and uh, it was a sixth form college, and those used to be, I'm not sure if they are so much now, quite sort of popular around the country um, in order to achieve your A-levels. Uh, so college, by name, is a thing out there, and sometimes you will come across... Um, higher education places that are referred to as college as well, like St. Martin's College in the United Kingdom. But yes, university is more common, but it, it's common here too. We must remember that. A lot of universities do go by that name, Butler University, you know, um, the University of Chicago, uh, many others. But I think when kids uh, or, or their parents say that they're going off to this higher education um, institution they will they will say oh he's going to college you know um so it's it's more in how we speak about it in, in the the vernacular rather than the official names i think um and then the final question this week comes from ib stevie b who asks is bollocks a swear word yes it is in the uk in fact a study done uh, i think it was back in 2001 uh, found it to be a rather severe swear word that was up there with some of the more severe ones um, but in the US, it is less severe because it appeared, in, for instance, in a Newcastle Brown Ale advertisement. 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 We say advertisement back in the UK. You guys say advertisement. Whatever, you know, each to his own. Um, but yes, bollocks is, uh, is quite a severe swear word. And it's, just, it's great being in the US because I can say it to anyone and no one will take offence. Uh, they might laugh a little bit. Um, I remember getting into a conversation um, with a, a customer at work once um, over the word, and I was just saying it to them very uh, liberally and freely, um, and there was no complaint put in. But if I did that in the UK, I would have been fired again for it. Uh, not again. It's never happened before. All right, that's why I ended up in America. I, I admit so, and that's it for this episode of Ask a Brit. In the meantime, you can visit me at lostinthepond.com. You can also, of course, if you haven't already, subscribe to me here on YouTube. And please, please, please follow me on Instagram because I am uh, very, very vain and want people to look at pictures of me. You know, they are clean. I've got my clothes on again, so it's all above board. Um, but until next time, have a great week, and I do have some more videos coming out this week, so check those out. Until then, uh, instead of cheerio, what can I say? Auf Wiedersehen. It's German. Um, bye.